Cornell, and then took just a little bit of time off to study oxidative DNA damage at NYU. Um, after that, she started at Yale under Chinadam Asuji, Dr. Chinadam Asuji, where she currently studies some of the phenomena behind block copolymer alignment. Um, she plans to finish her PhD within the next year and has many exciting plans in her future. So without much further ado, please join me in welcoming Katarina Rafuenko. Hi everyone, thanks so much for having me. Uh, I see a lot of people in the room that I spoke to today and we talked a lot about science but also about uh, the rainy winter you guys had. <laughs> I'm very sorry. <laughs> uh, it's really great for me to be here and I'd like to thank you all and I'd like to thank uh, DYSS for this really great, really great opportunity and it's a really unique opportunity for me. Um, the title of my talk is Magnetic Alignment of Black Copolymer Microdomains by Intrinsic Chain Anisotropy. And one of the interesting things, or one of the unique things about this talk is that I can spend longer on an introduction and background because normally conference talks are 10, 20 minutes and this one is longer. So I'm really excited to be able to give you background on the physics of the system that I will talk about so that when I get to the experimental data, we're all on the same page and we can all, we can all follow along. So in the Osuji group, we're interested in creating uh, aligned, ordered, periodic nanostructures. And these, things, uh, these types of materials or morphologies could be used for a variety of applications. And this, this figure is from a review paper from our group from a few years ago. But here you can see a schematic for some of the, the possible applications that you could have if you, were able, if you were able to create these aligned ordered periodic nanostructures. A very simple example to understand is a filtration membrane. If you are able to create non-tortuous voids uh, that are all of uniform size, you can make a size exclusion membrane. Uh, you, can, uh, you can make pattern media for the semiconductor industry. There's a constant drive to create features that are smaller and smaller and that are closer and closer together. Um, additional Additional applications are nanowire arrays, uh, perhaps uh, use, using uh, templated synthesis, optical materials, ion conducting membranes, semiconductor membra membranes, etc. So for these types of applications in our group, we, we focus on using what we call, or what, is no, what are known as block copolymers. And specifically in this talk, I'll talk mostly about linear dye block copolymers, which are shown here. So in general, block copolymers are homopolymer chains covalently bonded to each other. And in this very simple case, uh, these, two, uh, these two chains are covalently bonded at their ends. And what makes these systems appealing for those applications I just showed is their innate ability to self-assemble into a variety of structures. Uh, and these structures are accessible um, depending on the volume fraction or the relative volume fraction of these two blocks. So if you have about 50% A and 50% B, uh, these structures, these materials could assemble, self-assemble into lamellar sheets, parallel, parallel lamellar sheets. If you have, say, about 30% by volume A of the total, total volume, you can get cylinders of A and a matrix of B, and the reverse morphologies are also possible. Uh, cylinders are, and lamellae are the morphologies I'll talk most about today. But a part of the phase diagram are also other more common morphologies, such as gyroid and spheres. And there are even more morphologies uh, available, uh, though they're, they're very small parts of the, of the phase space. So just to harp on this point of self-assembly, the, the two blocks are distinct from each other, and so they would prefer to be far away from each other and minimize their contact energies. But they're covalently linked together, so they're not able to do that. So what they do is like goes with like, and this is the, you know, a cartoon version of how this self-assembly occurs. And a lot of times for application purposes or for our research purposes, we're interested in the domain spacing or the periodic spacing of these materials. And this periodic spa spacing goes as the molecular weight of the polymer to a known exponent depending on the system. And normally this exponent is between one half to two thirds. So a little bit more on this, on this micro phase separation. Uh, this is the, the general phase di diagram for linear dye blocks. On the x-axis we have that F, that volume fraction that I talked about on the previous page. 
And on the y-axis is the product of chi, the Flory-Huggins interaction parameter, and n, the degree of polymerization, or the, the, in, es in essence, the, the length of this chain. So chi, the Flory interaction parameter, indicates how compatible the two blocks are. So if you have a higher chi, the, the blocks are very incompatible with each other, and you're more likely to form these self-assembled structures. Here, the L is for that lamellar structure, and C is for cylinders. So if you're in this phase space, you have one of the ordered structures. And if you're in this space right here, you're disordered. So there's no structure. Um, so this cartoon for the disordered phase and a cartoon for the ordered, the ordered lamellar phase. And this chi, this Flory interaction parameter, has an inverse relationship in temperature. So for our work, we frequently go through this phase space from the ordered to the disordered simply by heating or cooling the materials. And at this order disorder transition temperature, I'll refer to it as TODT, the sample undergoes a very sharp decrease in viscosity, and then the material becomes disordered. And again, this is, this is a thermally reversible transition. So blockopolymers are very tunable. You can, um, with the increasing synthetic capabilities um, or with that organic chemists are exploring, you really have an infinite amount of possibilities. You can change the chemistry of each of the two blocks, and that's just when you're using two blocks. You could use more blocks if you wanted to get into more co complicated architectures. But even for just a linear dye block, there are a lot of possibilities uh, with tuning the molecular weight and the chemistry. And of course, uh, the structure affects the function, and you can also tune, tune the properties of the system. And as I said before, you can tune uh, the dimension size to whatever application you are, you are targeting um, using uh, molecular weight and the Flory Huggins interaction <coughs> parameter. So, what we want to, the question we want to answer and explore is can we, we know these materials self assemble and can we use their innate self assembly to make something that, that could be potentially useful? Um, and in our group, we're also primarily interested in studying the fundamentals of, of these systems. So, I've talked about the self assembly and some of the applications. Uh, but for most of these applications, it's really important to note that the applications require alignment and long range order. And what, that, what, I'm, what I mean by that is if you want to make a membrane, you want the pores of the membrane to always be perpendicular to your membrane. Uh, if it, that's not the case, your membrane wouldn't, wouldn't function very well. So in, throughout the block of polymer literature, there have been a lot of studies into this alignment of, micro, of these features, such as the cylinders and the lamellae. So there have been so many, and so I'm just, just listing a few here. There's solvent vapor annealing, or chemical and surface patterning for thin films, laser zone annealing, which using, uses a thermal, a thermal gradient, um, and also other gradients are used, electric fields uh, or shear, uh, to align materials. But, you can probably guess, and in our group, we use magnetic fields to do this, uh, to drive this self-assembly. So in the magnetic field route, the driving force for the alignment is the anisotropy and the magnetic susceptibility, and I'm going to talk about this in future slides. I do want to point out that this chi was used for the Flory-Huggins interaction parameter a few slides ago, um, but from here on now, when I say delta chi, I'll be talking about the magnetic susceptibility. But magnetic fields have certain advantages and disadvantages compared to the other methods, and some of its, some of its unique features are that magnetic field alignment is space pervasive, so you don't need to have direct contact with the material. They could cover large volumes, and uh, because of these two things, the field direction can be changed relative to the sample. So for instance, if you're using shear alignment to orient block copolymer domains, usually you get the domains oriented along the shear direction. But because in the field uh, there's no direct contact, we can do arbitrary orientations of our alignment. So just to harp on this point of self-assembly versus directed self-assembly, in a material that's self-assembled, you might have um, anisotropic properties only lo locally. So this would be a grain of, let's say, cylindrical morphologies, and next to it is another grain and another grain. Um, but what you want for an application is control over macroscopic properties of the material. So you want to globally orient uh, the, domains, the domains of the material. So a question you might be thinking right now is why, why do polymers align in magnetic fields to begin with? Uh, so to this, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about diamagnetic susceptibility, again, delta chi. 
So this delta chi is defined as the difference in, in susceptibilities of an object in two perpendicular directions. So if this, this value is non-zero, non then a material will have a certain preference um, in orientation relative to an applied field. So here are just a few functional groups that are commonly found um, to serve as examples, a phenyl ring, a biphenyl species, and also an alkane chain. And these are the susceptibilities and SI units for each of these species. You can see that this one has a, has a negative sign. Um, and you can see that they have different magnitudes. So what these, what these values mean is that, um, or what they imply is that the phenyl ring and the biphenyl that the biphenyl species have a slight preference to align um, with their edge parallel to the magnetic field. And the alkane chain has this preference to align perpendicular to the magnetic field. But if we take one of these molecules and we perform this thought experiment and we place it in, in an accessible magnetic field, we find that the molecule never reaches its preferred orientation relative to the field. If we continue the thought experiment and now have a collection of these molecules where their long axes are facing all in the same direction, we now find that we're able to align them in their preferred orientation. And to see why this is taking place, we need to look at the thermodynamic driving force for alignment, which is shown right here. It's a function of delta chi and the field strength squared, and in the, in the denominator, there's a permittivity constant. But the magnetostatic energy that acts on an object uh, that quantity multiplied by the volume of that object must be sufficiently larger than thermal energy for alignment to take place. So from that, we know that for alignment to take place, we need some, some combination of large magnetic susceptibility, large grains, um, large volumes, or large field strengths. So our, for our field alignment, um, we have a superconducting um, magnet in our field shown here. Uh, we can go for anywhere from zero to six Tesla. Uh, for those of you familiar with um, an MRI machine, those are normally one to three Tesla. So this is a very, very strong, strong magnet. Uh, the, the coils are kept at, I think, four Kelvin. Um, so it's a, it's a serious piece of machinery that requires a lot of energy input to, to keep running. And in, in this setup, we have an in situ small angle X-ray scattering. So we can look at the, we can look at any periodic um, periodicities that are in our sample in situ as a function of field strength or cooling rate or temperature, and we can analyze the data um, with this 2D detector here. So the scattering data gives us um, gives us the momentum transfer, and from that we can extract real real um, real space information about the system. So I wanted to very quickly go through a general alignment procedure that we do in the lab. Um, so I just want to point out that this inner, inner region is just uh, the beam stop, and what I'm looking at is this, this, this outer ring here. So we start off at some temperature where we have an ordered structure, so let's say it's, it's cylinder forming, um, and the repeat unit in the system is 11.4 nanometers. We heat this material above that ODT, the order disorder transition temperature, and the intensity of this primary peak drops, drops dramatically. And then the alignment takes place during this next step where we cool this material in the presence of the magnetic field. Now we can compare the two images. In this case, we see that all of the, or most of the um, scattering intensity is concentrated equatorially compared to isotropically here. And this tells us that in this case, the cylinders are now um, have a very strong preference, this order parameter is almost unity to be oriented uh, parallel with the magnetic field. So previously aligned, uh, previously magnetically aligned systems generally fell between these three classes, uh, rod coil black hole polymers, liquid crystalline black hole polymers, and surfactant mesophases. But almost all the work has been done in these liquid crystalline black hole polymers. Uh, and these polymers were designed such that attached to one of the blocks, either supramolecularly through hydrogen bonding or covalently, there was an attachment of this uh, biphenyl-based mesogenic system. Um, these, liquid crystal, these liquid crystalline systems might uh, remind you of uh, materials that are present in, in LCD screens, for instance. Um, so the black hole polymers were designed in this way because it was believed that it was only due to this um, combined effort 
of liquid crystal and packing that there would be enough magnetic susceptibility for alignment to take place uh, in the system. So the, these blockopolymers were specifically designed with these mesogenic units uh, to induce alignment in these you know, fields of two to, two to six Tesla. So in, the, in my first project, um, we found that we were able to align a system that we didn't think we could align, and it was, it's something you maybe never want to admit, but it was a control experiment, and it was something we had no idea the results we saw, so then we had to go on and learn more about the system and explain it. So we were working with this polystyrene, poly-4 vinyl pyridine black polymer. Uh, the molecular um, weights in uh, kilograms per mole are shown, are shown here for each of the blocks. And we were actually studying the system, and we were attaching via hydrogen bonding another molecule to coordinate with this nitrogen group. And we found that this blended system was able to be aligned in the magnetic field, and we thought, oh, this small molecule additive was, was helping it align. This is so great. <laughs> Um, and what we found when we did the control experiment by removing the small molecule was that the material on its own aligned even better than in the presence of the small molecule. So the system has a despacing of 9.5 nanometers, which is, which is quite small. And uh, I'm showing here a waterfall plot. So each of, these, uh, each of these lines in this waterfall plot corresponds to one um, one 2D snapshot at a certain temperature of the scattering pattern of this polymer. So if I can just walk you through this, we start at room temperature with this isotropic ring, we heat the, mat the, the material above its order disorder transition temperature, and then we cool it in the presence of the, the field, and now we see this preferential scattering equatorially telling us that we have this arrangement of lamellar sheets that are parallel to the magnetic field, and we know that this must be a, a degenerate configuration like shown here. So we wanted to look more closely at this alignment. So this, um, first I'm showing the alignment as we go through that order disorder transition temperature. You start off with this low intensity, low intensity disordered ring, and as you cool the material, you see a concentration of intensity equatorially. And then when you're about 10 degrees below the TODT, it no longer matters how fast you cool or quench to room temperature. So in, it's in this transition that the material goes from, um, from very low viscosity to high viscosity. So once you're at that threshold, the material is essentially frozen, and now you can expect that as long as you don't recool this material to about 260 C, uh, your material, your, the, the domains of your material will stay aligned in, in that direction. We looked at the effect of cooling on this material, and this is the cooling rate, 2 degrees C, 0.5, and 0.1 through this ODT region, so just about these, um, these 20 de this 20 degree region. And we found, uh, as expected, that slower cooling results in, in stronger, stronger alignment. And we, we can explain this, uh, we believe we can explain this in two ways. So when you're in this disordered state, you're going to get, um, as you're cooling through the disordered state, you're going to get a nucleation event. And as you get a nucleation event, let's say, of a lamellar system or a lamellar grain, the grain will grow. And then it'll get to some characteristic volume at which um, now the field can act on it. So then it will rotate when it gets to that characteristic volume. So when we cool at a slower cooling rate, we give the system more time to get to its, its preferred orientation. Another thing that could happen when we cool slower, and we've seen this in some other work that happened actually af after this, is that slower cooling can also induce larger grains to form in the first place, which would also help, um, help, make, help create stronger alignment. Um, if you recall, the thermodynamic driving force for alignment is a function of the field strength squared, so as expected, we see that the higher the field, the better the alignment. Um, in this center plot, I'm just showing the quantified data of these, these 2D data. Uh, and here, we quantified the quality of alignment um, with the full width at half max of this, of this peak um, that was fitted to a, a Gaussian curve. So you can see in these black dots, as you go to higher field strengths, you see a smaller full width at half max and better alignment, and conversely, or similarly, as you go to slower cooling rates, you see, you see better alignment. 
So these results were very, very interesting for us because, as I said, most blockopolymer systems were designed with these liquid crystalline units, but of course this system doesn't have any, any such moieties. And the, um, the susceptibility of a coil-coil system like this one was expected to be on the order of 10 times 10 to the negative 10. And if this was in fact the magnetic susceptibility, you would need extremely, extremely high fields um, to, to cause the type of alignment results that we were seeing. So we had collaborators do, um, uh, in Corio Hearn's group at Yale, do coarse grain molecular dynamic simulations for us. And in, in these simulations, they tethered homopolymer polystyrene chains to an impenetrable wall. Uh, it was a five by five chain array. And uh, this should be moving, but uh, these are the results of the, of the simulation. And these are the, um, these are the results uh, quantified. So I'd like to go through this figure. So on the x-axis, it's the aerial density of the chains on this impenetrable wall. So the higher the value, the more closely the chains are spaced together. And the y parameter, or the y-axis shows this, this order parameter. If the order parameter were zero, it would mean that both the carbon-carbon the background and the phenyl ring would have no preferential orientation um, relative to this impenetrable wall. Um, and as these values deviate from zero, uh, it means there's a greater tendency for, in this case, of the backbone, the alkane chain, to be perpendicular to this wall and of the phenyl group to be parallel to this wall. And we did this calculation for several um, degrees of polymerization or lengths of monomers, and we found that it was almost invariant uh, to the length uh, of the chain. So we know that all materials, including alkane chains and phenyl rings, have some sort of diamagnetic susceptibility. So we use these, uh, these, simu these, uh, we use these results to get an estimate of delta chi to see if it was really on the order of 10 times 10 to the negative 10 uh, as previously expected. So we did a very simple calculation to estimate delta chi uh, using the MD simulations. We broke it down into two components, the backbone, the carbon-carbon backbone, and the phenyl ring. And we looked at the volume fraction of the system that was backbone and phenyl ring, uh, multiplied by the order parameter at the relevant aerial density of chains that we would expect in our block copolymer. And in this case, um, we're using that um, that impenetrable wall to represent the intermaterial dividing surface between the two blocks. And then we multiplied it by the known uh, lit literature values of magnetic susceptibility. And this gave us an estimate of about minus two times 10 to the negative eighth, which is about two orders of magnitude higher uh, than originally expected. So we wanted to see if this value of magnetic susceptibility uh, made sense with our field dependent data. So we looked at the again, at the order parameter um, in this system, and we know that it's a function of uh, Boltzmann, it's a, Bolt, it's a function of the Boltzmann di distribution of magnetostatic energy. So what this diagram is showing is the order parameter as a function of field, given this magnetic susceptibility for different size grains, and these grains are shown in nanometers. So I can walk you through, for instance, one of these or two of these lines. So here, if you have an average of 250 nanometer grains in the system, you would expect almost no alignment, the order parameter is near zero, even for fields up to six tesla. If instead you look at grains that are about 1.5 microns in size, you would expect an appreciable response, so you, you would expect alignment um, if you had grains of this, of this size. So how does our data stack up to this? So we can, also estimate order parameters from our experimentally, experimental field, field data. So we did that, and you could see these black dots here are our experimental results. We fitted uh, these experimental results using this equation to extract, um, to extract uh, an average, an estimate of 1.2 microns as the size of the grain um, that would be necessary in this, during the alignment process, to give the field-dependent data that we see before. And again, this is the value that you would expect as you're cooling through that order disorder transition temperature at this size grain. Given this anisotropy, the grain would now have sufficient, um, it would have sufficient 
um, magnetostatic energy to overcome, overcome thermal forces. And I'd just like to point out that this doesn't include any sort of kinetic consideration and is purely thermodynamical. So just to, just to repeat that, we found that during alignment, our estimate using um, MD simulations was that grains were around 1.2 microns. When we look at transmission electron microscopy images, we see very large grains. If you can, I don't know if it's visible, but this is a two micron by two micron image, and all of this is just is one grain. Um, uh, you could see that the, the pitch here, the D spacing, again, is around 10 nanometers. Um, but when we look at these TM images, we see grains that are larger than three microns in size. And we used an additional method, which I don't have time to go through today, to also estimate the size of the grains to be five to, five to six microns. Uh, and these numbers deviate slightly, um, or they, they definitely deviate from each other, but we believe that, it's, um, that they're quite compatible with each other, and that's because this is the estimated grain size at this high temperature of 250, mi uh, 250 C, whereas these are room temperature grains. So it's very possible that uh, the material um, aligned and then the grains coarsened without any further improvement in alignment. And another, another, possibility, another possibility is that these grains were actually larger to begin with, but then suffered some sort of kin kinetic hindrances such as impingement, et cetera, and gave us um, the field-dependent response that, that we saw. So through all of this, we we got this very obvious and you know, real understanding that grain size uh, was very important in, in block polymer alignment. So we delved further into this. We had a system that was very similar to the system I just talked about. It was the same material, polystyrene, polyforvinyl pyridine. Uh, but it was a different molecular weight. It was slightly less. So this is the, the system I just talked about, and this is the new system. And this is the small angle x-ray scattering data showing that they're of lamellar morphology. And we wanted to understand why this one aligns quite well, and this one does not align well at all. So if you look at the thermodynamic driving force, you see that delta chi is important, um, B squared is important, and of course volume is important. So of course we're controlling the field, so that's constant. We would expect this um, susceptibility to be about the same because it's this chemically the same material. So our hypothesis was that the only thing different in these systems is likely the grains. So we wanted to see, I was warned. <laughs> so we wanted to see if, um, if we made it blends of these two systems, if, they're, um, if they, the alignment response would also be interpolated between the two ones. So we made, as I said, we made three blends of these systems. So on the x-axis is the, the fraction of the blended system that is this 5.5K material. So here it's the neat 5.5K total material, and here it's this neat 2K, 2K um, total 4K material. And these are the three blends that we made um, of intermediate volume fractions. We see that the d-spacing and the ODTs interpolate um, nearly linearly. Um, not, not, not quite, there's of course, there's deviation from linearity, but this told us that these materials were, um, they were well mixed and they were not macrophase separated. So then we looked at the, um, at the alignment of these blends, and you can see that in fact alignment does increase the more um, of the 2.7, 2.8K you put into the, the system. Um, on, this, on this curve I'm showing, first if we look at this, these are the 1D plots of these uh, 2D representations and the, the Gaussian curves that we fitted, and then the extracted uh, full width at half max values, which are plotted on uh, this, left, this left axis, and then we can convert those values into the order parameters so they're shown on the same axis. And as you increase the amount of the higher molecular weight material, you get a better, better aligned system. So to, to look at our hypothesis, we, we needed to see does the grain size increase as the alignment improves. So we used again the, our collaborators at, at Brookhaven National Labs um, and they looked at some 2D scattering data for us and the, using the variance scattering method determined an, an average characteristic grain size that was present in the system as a function of that, that volume fraction. So if you look at the two endpoints, these are the two neat materials, you see that the 2.7, 2.8 
has, um, according to their um, calculation, about grains that are about three, three times as large as the 2K, 2K case. And something's going on here where it's not a linear, um, a linear trend, but you do see larger grains um, or something in intermediate between the two endpoints. So this three-fold difference in grains is quite large because the magnetostatic energy goes by volume, so about 30-fold times difference in magnetostatic energy would be predicted from this difference in grains. So if you recall, the 2.7, 2.8K, we had estimated that it had grains on the order of 1.2 microns during that alignment process. Um, if we extrapolate that to this 2K, 2K case, um, we can, uh, if we have 1.2 micron grains, divide by three, which is the difference in uh, these two values, we get grains of about 400 nanometers. So if we go back to this field-dependent curve, we can look at this uh, for about 400 nanometer curve, and we would expect that at six tesla, a 400 nanometer um, grain would have an order parameter of about 0.2, and going um, right, right here, 0.2. And then if we go back to um, the results, we actually see that that's exactly what we have for our 2K, 2K system right here, an order parameter of about 0.2. So these are, we made a lot of um, qualitative estimates here, but the point that I'm trying to relay is we found that almost all the deviation and alignment of these two systems could be explained by grain size differences. So we know that grain size is important, and I've talked about two, um, two PSP4VP systems, one that aligns well and has large grains, and one that aligns not so well, um, and grains uh, are not so big. But uh, there's no reason why this shouldn't be able to be applied to other systems. As I said, there's nothing special inherent about these systems. They're not liquid crystalline. So we started looking through polymers on our shelves in the lab um, to see what else we could, we could find that aligned. Um, and we found that uh, polystyrene polydimethylsiloxane aligns as well. And PDMS is, a, is, a commonly used, um, is the most commonly used silicon-based based polymer, and we found that we could align cylinders of PSPDMS uh, also in the field. These are TM images looking along the field direction and uh, perpendicular to the field direction. Um, we also, we looked at this system more, and we found that at slower cooling rates, just like in the previous system, the alignment improves, but we found that we needed to cool this system significantly slower. Um, about uh, an order of magnitude slower than the PSP4VP system for the same level of, level of alignment. Um, and we, I, I would like to point out here that um, these, we call these spotty. You can see that these X-ray scattering patterns are less uniform than the ones I showed before. And this is due to the fact that the X-ray beam is pro probing less, less grains, so the images is more spotty. Um, so we know that the grains in this system are likely larger than in the other system, but perhaps for some reason there are more kinetic hindrances, and that's why you have to cool slower. Um, we also know that the magnetic susceptibility is a little bit lower because this PDMS uh, is not aromatic, and the aromatic group has a little bit higher susceptibility. But um, uh, these are just our, our, our ideas, but we do find that we can reach the same level of alignment, but must, must, must cool significantly slower. We also looked at the field response, and I think in these images you can see that spotty pattern a little more clearly than I was saying, but as expected, as you um, use a constant cooling rate, but a higher field, uh, the alignment or the sharpness um, of these peaks improves. So just to recap, I, I've talked about uh, this P PSPDMS system. I've just showed you those results. And before, I talked about these, this lamellar PSP4VP system. We also had collaborators at Greece synthesize um, a cylinder-forming low molecular weight system for us. Uh, and again, the despacing here is below, below 10 nanometers, and the diameter of these inner, inner cylinders is 3 to 4 nanometers. Um, and we're also able to align cylinders of PSPDMS PDMS extremely well in the field. So once we saw that this system was aligning very well, we thought, well, what, could we, what else could we do with it? So our general idea 
um, was to use some sort of sacrificial material to add into this PSP4VP system. So in this case, we have cylinders of P4VP in a matrix of PS. And we wanted to add some sort of sacrificial material that would sequester with the P4VP that perhaps could later be removed to create a nanoporous material. Um, I'd like to say that we're still, we're still in, the, in the fairly early stage of this project, but when we were thinking of what material to use, we decided to use polyethylene glycol or, or PEG. And we decided to use PEG for two reasons, or several reasons. Uh, one of the reasons was that PEG, of course, is soluble in water while the black polymer is not, and we thought we could easily remove it from inside. And also, PEG is known to sequester preferentially with P4VP, or it's known to be um, fairly, um, uh, it could dissolve well with the P4VP. So that was our initial, initial idea. So in doing, in, in, you know, in getting to the final product here, there's lots of things we need to consider, uh, including how does this PEG sequester with the P4VP? Does it sequester primarily with the P4VP block? And how much PEG can we, can we add? How does the addition of PEG affect the field alignment with respect to the weight percent of PEG or the molecular weight of the PEG? And then, of course, can PEG be leached out of the material after alignment? So to answer the sequestration um, idea with how much PEG can be added, we turn to differential scanning calorimetry, or DSC. Um, so this method would, modify, um, would show us any, any transitions, uh, endothermic, exothermic transitions that happen in the system. So this first curve is the trace for the neat polymer. Um, normally in this polymer, we would expect to see two glass transition temperatures, one at around 100 for PS and one at around 150 for P4VP. We only see one of them, and we think this is due to the high amount of PS in the system relative to the total volume. When we add 10% of 1K, 1 kilodalton peg, into the system, we see no, not much of a change in the location of this glass transition temperature of PS, and we see no additional peaks forming. If we increase the amount of PEG in the system to 20% by, by weight, now we see a very strong um, first order peak here. And we can attribute this um, uh, due to liter from literature to the crystallization of PEG. And we think that the crystallization of PEG um, would be occurring at the system at these higher amounts of PEG. So that would mean that the PEG is no longer the PEG is no longer sequestering within the P4VP domains, but is now macrophase separating out. And of course, we wouldn't want that if we want to remove the PEG, the PEG later. We also looked at a 10% wet PEG system, but of a higher molecular weight than before. And we see that molecular weight matters too. So at this higher amount of PEG, we also see this crystallization peak. So from this, um, we, we concluded that the molecular weight of PEG relative to the P4VP block dictates the extent of its miscibility in the system, and that the PEG would crystallize as above a certain threshold concentration. And these are important things to keep in mind as we try to produce this nanoporous material. So the TODT, or the order disorder transition temperature, is really important in our field alignment. So we wanted um, to know what the effect of the addition of PEG was on the ODT. So we did this by creating several blends. Um, so these are the weight percent blends of PEG in, the, in this cylindrical forming system. And we monitored the primary peak that we see in SAC. So during the transition, you have a low intensity broad peak becoming a, a higher intensity sharp peak. So each of these curves shows um, a normalized uh, low intensity in the disordered state and um, an increased intensity. So to calculate or to extract the TODT, we looked at the half um, drop in intensity here and read off the, the transition, the ODT temperatures. So you could see right away that adding 10% PEG has a really big drop in the order disorder transition temperature of, of the system. Um, and this is giving us more information that PEG is like, likely sequestering within the block polymer because it's lowering the, the Flory-Huggins chi parameter in the system. So we plotted on the y-axis the normalized changes in ODT compared to the neat material, and we can see that they follow a straight line as a percentage of PEG added. I mentioned earlier that in differential scanning calorimetry above 
Somewhere here, we see an onset of crystallization. And if the peg is no longer going into the blockopolymer but is sequestering out, we would expect no additional change in the odor disorder transition temperature. And when we made these blends, we see just that, that this level essentially plateaus. So it supports our hypothesis that there's some crystallization of PEG taking place. The last thing we looked at was the effect um, of cooling rate on alignment of this system. Um, to make uh, very highly aligned materials, how slow do we have to cool the system? So again, we looked at the alignment using this Gaussian fit to extract the full width at half max. And we see that as we go to slower and slower cooling rates, um, our full width at half max decreases and the alignment becomes better and better. Um, I've added this point here, just um, this is not data, I've just added this as a guide to the eye because you would expect that at infinitely slow cooling you would get an infinitely sharp peak. Um, but this point allows you to get a, shape, a sense of the shape, the shape of this curve. Um, one more thing we looked at was the effect of the molecular weight of PEG on the order disorder transition temperature. So this red curve is showing that order disorder transition temperature um, for the 1K PEG material. And here is the same amount of PEG but now a 0.6K material. And you can see that there's a further depression of the TODT. So this gives us another way to modulate the order disorder transition temperature with the keeping the same amount of PEG but changing its molecular weight. And when we created a blend of these two materials, um, about 4% of the 0.6K and 6% of the 1K, we get something in between. So it's fully, uh, fully tunable if we want to get to a certain order disorder transition temperature. So lower molecular weight PEG gives us a greater TODT depression. So this was the final, um, um, this was the very highly aligned, slow cooled material that we made. So this is that um, cylinder forming PSP4VP blended with 10% of 1K PEG. Um, you can see from this TM, the uh, field direction is marked here, that we have this very nice pattern and uh, these, these, these cylinders are very, very small in size um, compared to a lot of block of polymer work. So uh, for, these, for all of these TM that I'm showing, we took the bulk sample and then microtomed it. Um, which is sort of like a fancy deli slicer, and then we floated them, uh, these slices on top of water. And we have some preliminary evidence to support that the, this process on its own removed the polyethylene glycol from the system, but we're still doing further experiments. Um, but this is the current, um, st the, the current stage of this project. We're currently doing some experiments to, to validate the microporosity uh, of these systems and to um, test um, the effectiveness of the PEG removal uh, using simply dissolution in water. So with that, I'd like to conclude my talk. Um, I hope I've shown you that um, in this work, uh, I've demonstrated that coil-coil block of polymers can be aligned um, in experimentally accessible magnetic fields via what we've turned intrinsic chain anisotropy. Uh, in, this first work, in our first work, we propose an explanation for this behavior. Uh, which stemmed from estimating delta chi from coarse grade molecular dynamic simulations. Um, that, the, that estimate of delta chi coupled with the very large grains present in our system fully explained the alignment that we see. We found that we can expand this to other systems. I mentioned PSPDMS, but we found others that also can be off the shelf block of polymers that can be aligned in the field. And we're looking at blends with homopolymer uh, for more specific um, potential applications. And my current and future work in this area is assessing whether the PEG can be leached out by dissolution in water and also determining the resulting structure after leaching. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening. Um, I'd like to thank my collaborators at Yale, at Brookhaven, um, University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, University of Ioannina, and my funding sources. And again, I really want to thank you all for the opportunity to present here. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you.